quickly what the Yang tools are, what Yang brings to the party uh, in ODL uh, and in general, and uh, talk about the Yang tools themselves a little bit. Uh, and then I'll also talk about other communities that are working on Yang models. Um, ODL uh, is using uh, Yang models that are created both here and other places. So we'll talk about where those are, how you can get involved. And then Ronaldo's gonna talk about um, uh, best practices and um, you know recommendations and caveats for when you're actually building stuff using the models and the tools. So Yang tools uh, is something that that have been around since the beginning of the ODL project. Um, Yang tools are fundamental to the MD Sal concept. Um, you know Yang Yang tools um, are a set of tools that are built around processing the Yang modeling language as an input. Um, Yang itself is a modeling language. Um, and by the way, Yang is, Yang is closely associated to NetConf, but doesn't require NetConf, nor does it require RESTConf either. Um, it provides a modeling language that, uh, all, you know, the modeling language itself provides semantics and data uh, organization of, of uh, data. Um, and and, and uh, models can be augmented, um, much in the way sort of like we used to do with SNMP where you had MIBs. So you have sort of Yang modules, which are effect effectively um, pieces of a big conceptual tree. Uh, and so um, Yang data is, um, uh, is, is, is modeled um, in a config tree and an operational tree effectively, although there's conversations about doing other kinds of uh, subtrees. Uh, Yang provides a couple of uh, important other functions, uh, RPCs, uh, which are uh, important uh, for communication between the client and server. Um, by the way, uh, uh, you know, that's again, originally came out of NetConf uh, itself, although it's, it's used uh, in other contexts. Um, just like with SNMP, uh, there are notifications uh, in Yang uh, that can be defined and how they're implemented is a matter of the protocol that, 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 uh, that is used. Um, Yang models are specified in ASCII text files, so there's not a magic binary format or anything that, that's required, so they're easy to process. Um, and I mean, this is maybe a matter of, of personal opinion, but it's fairly simple and compact uh, and fairly straightforward to understand. Um, most people that I've ever talked to and shown a, a simple model can sort of handle that uh, without much kind of information about what's going on. Um, and the latest, the latest standard for, for Yang is, is um, defined in 6020, RFC 6020 from the ITF, uh, which is what we use here. So what do Yang tools do? Um, conceptually, Yang tools um, in ODL generate Java code from Yang inputs, um, although uh, Yang tools themselves are, are effectively a compiler that takes Yang uh, as an input uh, and, and generates various outputs or can generate various outputs using what, are, what we're calling codecs. Um, in the case of Java, what generated classes uh, are mapped uh, to the DOM. Um, and then again, we can uh, output various formats that are mapped uh, to that. And I'll show you some examples of that in a second. Um, what's also cool about this is that the codecs are data driven, right? So you're taking Yang, which is data, um, and generating, you know, generating various interfaces from that same input, uh, which is really cool because Prior to this, we had to do all this stuff by hand. So I'll give you an example. Like in the MD Sal, um, one of the coolest parts of how the MD Sal works is that it's an auto-generated northbound, um, you know, RESTConf, inter RESTConf interface um, that's produced from this tool, uh, and the code is generated from that as well. And so there's, you know, you're, you're taking the human factor out of the process effectively, um, and so when the compiler is, is correct and is working properly, which it more or less does now, um, you generate the right APIs. Uh, and also, that same code can be used to not only generate code in the, 
in the MD South today, you can generate code in client applications potentially that talk to that same interface on the other side of the picture. Um, yeah, and I guess the other interesting thing here too is you can do model translations, right? So you can do with Yang tools, and in fact, some of the other compilers that are out there too, you can do like Yang to XSD and, and so on, uh, which is also interesting. So here's an example of uh, how we go from Yang, how we go from Yang to um, using the Java codec to generate uh, Java code. So we take a Yang definition of bridge name, and we're going to generate a public class uh, called bridge name uh, from that. Sorry about the build out here. I thought I thought I took all these out. Um, and you can see we auto generate a constructor for the class, and voila. And so this is effectively a stub function now, or a stub stub class. And you go in and you fill in the action functions for this class as you go. So to handle um, you know, where to go get the bridge name, you may add some other, you know, functionality in here. But the, you know, the general, you know, the general API now for this is generated, which is cool. Oh, sorry, there's another build out in here. So I have a bunch of these examples, but we don't have a ton of time, so I'm not going to run through every single one of these. Here we have a, a grouping in Yang of bridge attributes. Um, and, a leaf, and a leaf inside of this grouping container uh, called bridge name uh, with this type, and we'll see how we, we generate the. Um, well, sorry about that. About how we generate the class def for that. And again, you would go back after you generate this and, and augment this. Um, I'll just walk through here. It's a container definition. I meant to remove some of these. <laughs> There's too many of these things in here. We tried to, I mean, the slides are available online later, so I thought they'd be good to just leave these in so you can look at some good examples if you're interested. Uh, here we have a list. Uh, let's see how we generate. And we can generate searching for the list. So here's, here's maybe a little more interesting thing. Here's how we generate the RPC. So we have an RPC definition. Whoops. Get back here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Go away. Yeah, I know. All right, so here we have definition of an RPC. We have the, you know, the input and the output for the RPC with parameters. And here's how we generate the resulting uh, Java code for that. How does the name mapping work? So <coughs> I think that's actually a typo. It should be hello world. I, I should have actually uh, thanked Ed for this for these slides. He did he did these original slides in Giles. Yeah, the name the name should match. All right, run through this. Come on, forgot there were animations in here. Come on. All right, here we go. So the Yang, Yang to Java um, is cool because it's, you know, it's got these, these properties, right? It's consistent, um, you know, there's a consistent translation um, and, and it handles certain things for you automatically, right? Um, and this is stuff that's generated now, right? So we, we have, um, you know, these properties that it's immutable. Um, we have strongly typed um, input um, and obviously output from that now. Um, 
it's consistent because you know the compiler is generating the sort of the framework for the code here. Um, so again, you take out a lot of the human, you know, fat fingering uh, errors that you've had, um, and you can improve what's generated too. So if you realize, you know, hey, I'm generating, I'm not generating enough um, in the stub functions that I could generate. You can always go back and add that. You know, this is. Uh, this is a work in progress in a lot of ways, you know. So if you say, well, you know, all of the constructors that I have to generate have to do this, right? So you can go back and add that. Um, and then, and the cool part there too is, is that um, you're not going to go do that for the 500 classes that you previously generated. You do it once, and then you just regenerate. Um, and if you're you're merging the generated stubs with your um, handcrafted code, um, you know that. That, that's more or less automatic, which is, which is nice as well. Um, and I mentioned, you know, the automatic bindings uh, for RESTConf and NETCONF, which come for free in the package now. Um, and also, you know, there's, there's some other stuff coming on the horizon for some other message bus technologies and potentially, um, you know, things like potentially Python, you know, could be fairly straightforward to, to work on this. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, what's cool here is we're generating, um, you know, we're generating code inside of the MD cell, for example, here. Um, you could just as easily use this to generate code in a client application. Um, in this case, it would be a Java application with, you know, these sort of, uh, you know, bindings. Um, but you don't have to do that. You could have another codec that could generate um, different sorts of bindings for you, which is really cool. Um, other available tools. Um, so one of the things I wanted to make, you know, uh, kind of get get some information out on this. Um, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions about how to, you know, how to how to do modeling, how to validate your model, how to you know work on that. Because the Yang tools themselves don't really help in this regard. Uh, so there are other, you know, there are external tools like the Yang validator. Uh, there's there's P, P Yang. Uh, which is the uh, another open source um, compiler, uh, which is on GitHub, um, which I didn't list here. I should have listed. Um, and uh, Yang Validator is a, is a web-based, um, you know, sort of front end uh, for Pyang. So you can take your model, upload it, compile it, see if it's valid, check your uh, check on your dependencies and things like that. Um, NetConf Central is something that, that we've worked a lot with, um, myself and a couple of other folks. Uh, Andy Beerman runs NetConf Central. Um, there's a lot of tools there, other tools. There's, there's um, a pile of models that are there, examples. Uh, there's some, a lot of tutorials there uh, that can help if you're new to Yang. Uh, so check that out. Uh, we have a GitHub community that uh, a couple of us started, I don't know, about a year ago which is associated with a bunch of efforts that are going on, like at the ITF, there's a bunch of NetMod uh, models that are there, um, ITF models that are there. Um, we also have some IEEE models that are there, OpenConfig uses that as their repo. Um, at the ITF, um, there's a modeling coordination group for routing models, which is interesting for ODL. Um, might want to check that out. There's a there's a whole lot of modeling that's going on there uh, that's useful, um, and whether or not we want to consume those models here is you know is kind of up to us. But they're really good examples because there's a lot of people there that are um, you know very very good at Yang modeling. Um, and then if you have questions, um, if you're doing you know you're trying to figure something out in a model. Um, and you can't get an answer, uh, you can also ask the Yang doctors, the ITF, they're called the Yang doctors, but it's, I don't know, it's about 12 people. And somebody usually will answer your question. Um, I mentioned some of the other communities working on models. So IEEE just started working on models for um, bridging, uh, for example. Those are on the uh, GitHub repo. Um, open config. Uh, some of you guys have probably heard, like Anise gave a, gave a talk yesterday. Um, he started OpenConfig. Their models are hosted here. 
um, and MEF, Metro Ethernet Forum, um, is starting to do models uh, as well, and those might be interesting. So Ronaldo is going to uh, take it from here and uh, give you some recommendations. All right. <coughs> Thanks, Tom. Okay. Okay, so this is probably um, one of the most interesting slides. So let me, let me start by saying that I started using Ang models about maybe two years ago when I started developing uh, software for open daylight. And in the beginning, I struggled a lot on why Yang, right? And maybe for the new folks here, and maybe some of the experienced folks, right? I think this is important to answer this question appropriately. Why you should use Yang? What, 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 what benefits does it bring to you in the context of open daylight and in a broader context, right? And if you, if you get this, things become clearer, you know? So, Yang is a cornerstone of open daylight infrastructure, right? I would say it's a workhorse of open daylight, right? Why, and, and why is that? Because everything that you do in terms of plugins, interactions between plugins, and, and, and data store, storing information, is built with Yang, right? And it allows for a data model-driven development. So what, what, what do I mean by that? It means that basically um, allows you to model something. It can be a router, a switch, um, a person, a toaster, describe what it does, what its attributes, right? And then get that compiled into Java code, and integrate in your application. Okay, and so what? The data model is, is the live representation of the thing that you're working with or working upon. So the first thing that somebody comes when they work, they are, they are uh, joining a project, is they look at the code and, and bitch about it. The, the previous guy that didn't document any of, the, any, any of the code, right? Oh my God, this has no documentation, right? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna understand that. Right? So Yang provides this kind of live documentation. For me, uh, that's a extremely, that, 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 that's a very, that I would say, is very useful. For example, let, let, let me give you an example. I work mainly on the service function chaining project, right? And recently we integrated service function chaining and the OVSDB project. And in this process, I wanted to understand more about how the OVSDB uh, project worked. And before I even look at their code, I looked at the OVSDB models. Just by looking at the models and understanding nothing about their code, I could kind of figure out more or less what they were doing, right? That's the, that's the power of this thing, right? Instead of dwelling five months into looking at their code, you kind of hit the ground running. You look at the code, if, if the model is well maintained, there's the descriptions, you know, there's RPCs, you look at that and say, hmm, okay, I have an idea where they're going with this. Right? And then you look at the code. And since the Yang model is tied to the code, it forces, you, it forces you to update the Yang model when you want to do something different. It's not like documentation that you say, I'll do it tomorrow, and you never really do it. Right? So the Yang model becomes a live representation of everything you do. All right? So therefore, I say it's easy to understand the debug issues across applications. Right? It gives you persistency and clustering for free, right? Of course, there are a little bit of caveats around that, but you, you, you do all your code based on Yang, you get that, right? As opposed to something else. If you use Yang models and data store, you get what I call an anonymous point-to-point -point messaging system. That for me, it's one of the greatest strengths in open daylight. Right, in the beginning, in the service function chaining project, I started using that. People are like, why are you doing this? But it allows you, you allow plugins to communicate through the data store through Yang, right? Uh, very, in, in, in a very hands-off type, type, type of way, right? And it provides JSON bindings, REST conf support, and RPC support. So you put all this together, 
you figure out why Yang is so important in open daylight and the broader context, right? Okay. So there are a few things that you need to do when you're developing Yang models for open daylight, right? There, there are a few caveats that you need to understand that I went through, and I'm going to give you a few tips. There are the good things about Yang, and the things that there are some caveats that we're uh, that people are improving upon, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those things. So the first thing is is versioning, right? Usually, usually um, in Yang, Yang models, when you update the Yang models, the idea is that you rev you change the revision depending on the changes you do to the model, right? But the the, the classes and the packages that are regenerated from the Yang models are tie have the revision date in them, right? Therefore, if you go and rev the model, right, it becomes hard to come back here and change all your import, import statements, right? Uh, even with an IDE, right, it can be tricky. And it can be even trickier if you have, say, two, two models with different revisions. Right? The idea will try to get the class from one or to the other, and suddenly you find yourself putting all these prefixes, org, dot, open, delight, dot, this, dot, that, in order to specify uh, the, the, the class or the method that you want. So in the beginning of the service function chaining project, I was revving the models a lot. And after the, after the service function chaining project became really, really large, I, I stopped doing that. Right? I will probably rev when this is up you know, adopted by the ATF and become a standard, then I'll do a, a final revision of, say, the, the models. There are, some, there are some model validation limitations that you need to be aware. I mean, if you look at the open daylight list, people always trip on that, right? I mean, every, there's, every now and then somebody asks, asks about this, right? And this is something that it was greatly improved in lithium, and hopefully, it will be improved even more in beryllium, and Tony is there in the background, right? I mean, just look at the list of open delight. You see people, every now and then there's somebody that, boom, you know, trips on this, right? right? So the RFC 6020 has all these constraints that the Yang model and the back end need, 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 need to provide, right? So if you have two Yang models and one is tied to the other, right, saying, let us pose, let, 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 let me give you a simple example, right? You have a Yang model of a car, right? You have a Yang model of a factory, right? And the car and the factory points to the car, right? So today, this is, this is of course, an extreme example, but it, today you can ba basically delete the factory and the car is still there, right? You know what I mean? So, but you should not, right? Because you should delete the car first and then... It, so this kind of... Um, in in, in, this is kind of relationship today is not validated, right? And there are other, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, right? But there are some of these validations that since they are not done in, in, the, in the model, at the model level, you have to do in your code, right? But I would say that since this is improving, right? I would just keep this in mind. And, you know, as since it's improving in lithium, it's going to improve even more in beryllium, more and more of these validations are, are come. And it, you only probably need to do just small things here and there on your code. But it's something you need to keep in mind because if you do a Yang model, you test with RESTConf and say, well, well, I could do this, then you're going to hit some of these things, right? So, and this is what I said, I talked about. The, the most common pitfall is the fact that path integrity constraints are not validated, right? So I talked a little about this. This is a specific service function chaining um, Example, right? Basically, right? You can basically remove a path, right? Or, right? You can completely re remove a path, and with with the, with the, with the devices in it. But you should you should not be able to do that. We took care we take care of this in the code because when you started the service function chaining project was a long time ago. But as this is improving, hopefully uh, this is not going to be needed anymore. I mean, this validation at the at the application level. Right, so in Lithium, we recently fixed some things. For example, if you have a Yang model list, you can have minimum elements and max elements constraints. They are enforced for lists nowadays. In service function chaining, we use this heavily, right? Saying you want a path, it needs to be at, you want a, 
you want a path, you want your packet to traverse all these devices, well, we need to have at least one device, right? And it, it, can, it can have at maximum 255 devices, right? And there are many other examples, right? There is other, there is something else that is more an, an, an advanced topic, but when you're doing Yang modeling, in open daylight specifically, there are two ways you can represent a list, right? A list that doesn't need keys, I would say. You can do a, lift, a list or a lift list. I would urgently suggest you to use lists, right? Even if you don't need keys, you can create like an arbitrary key or, or say artificial key, which can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Because with a list, with the keys, it's much easier to create instance identifiers to you know, add, remove, update elements as opposed with lists, right? Because with lists, since there is no, there's no keys, sometimes you need to, to loop through a list to figure out the, the, the elements. Let me see what else. And known versus identities. This is a, this is a, big, this is a, big, um, it's a big item as well. So, and Gnomes and Yang, they, they are very nice, but they are not very extendable, right? So anytime you want to, anytime you want to convey a list of things that people are gonna be free to extend, not only you, but third parties as well, right? The recommendation is to use identities. So this is from the service function training project. So, a service function can be a firewall, can be a NAT, can be a DPI, can be a load balancer, can be a firewall of a certain vendor, a firewall of, you know, open source. So a anybody wants to be able to create a new identity, right? You can, you can represent that as in, in a big enum and have all this value zero, value one, value two, but that's not very extendable. It requires revving the models and things like that. So the idea is that you provide a list of identities, right? So if you want to create, say, firewall-foo, you go and create a new identity, right? And then everybody can extend the, mo extend the models with new identities, right? And I'm gonna give you another example about that. How is it done in the ITF interfaces model? Right? And that, that will become even, even clearer. And this, this is the, what I call the identity interaction model, right? So, if you, look, if you look at this, at these three things, right, these three identities, what, what, what do you see, right? You see a specific interface model, which is identity ISO 88023 CSMACD, right? So that is the identity of a specific interface, which use as a base type, right, the IANA interface type, right? So you see that you can create tons of identities here they all inherited from the base interface type. And not only that, the base IANA interface type inherits from the identity interface type. And why, why that is so important, this kind of identity indirection, right? Because you can create namespaces. If, for, for, for the sake of, 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 of this discussion, is in fact namespaces. For instance, I could create identity Cisco interface type in parallel to Diana interface type. And then all my interfaces here, all my identities would inherit it from, from the Cisco interface type, right? And then go, and then in fact what I'm creating is this namespaces that instead, so I don't need to touch the base interface type or the identity Diana or the identity Cisco interface type anymore. All I do is add more and more and more interfaces on this list. And this, this kind of identity interaction is covered in RFC 7, 7223 and 7224, if I'm not mistaken. So this is what I'm talking about, the identity interaction model. So you have um, easy to create a new namespace, such as identity vendor interface type. Easy to create new interface types without touching a rev in the base model, right? So it's very good for open source projects, right? I mean, the service function chaining project, we have many vendors, and sometimes they want to add a new type of load balancer. Instead of saying load balance, they can say load balance and say brocade, right? Which inherits from the brocade identity, which, which inherits from the base interface type. It, they don't need to touch the, interfa the base interface type or the uh, derived interface type, or the derived load balancer, if you will. Only all the devices that they create. 
So this is something that uh, is really is really this is like a, a it's like like, the, like like a gem, right? A golden gem here. So when you use augmentations in open daylight, which are very nice, right? Because when you augment a young model in open daylight, you also get all the generated code and everything. So it's really really nice, right? But when you use when you augment a model many times, the classes that are generated on the augmentations are generated with the names like augmentation one, augmentation two, augmentation three, augmentation four, right? So you don't you don't really know on the code, in the code, what augmentation one is really is, right? Because it, it just it just ge generates with these numbers, augmentation one, two, three, and four, right? And for the longest time. I was like, well, you know, having a piece of paper or something writing, what is augmentation one? Okay, oh, okay, this is open v switch. Oh, this is open flow, oh, but this is open flow for this extension. So I'm writing, okay. And then I figure out that you can use this young statement called extension augment identifier. Then you put that string there. That string becomes the class name. So it is you don't have like this augmentation one, two, three, four. I mean, this this stuff, I mean, is really nice. This should be like in the front page of the uh, of, of, of the young tool. Like, this is how you use augmentations, right? I mean, this is like very nice. Yeah, there is a reason. It's just like me when you don't know about it, right? That's the uh, that's the reason. <laughs> No. <laughs> so this is really nice from the Yang tool, Yang tool's perspective, right? He also, this Yang, this extension augmented identifier also has another fringe benefit. It avoids name collisions, right? When you use an IDE, and sometimes the IDE needs to pick the, 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 the class name or the method name, if there are two augmentations, one, Sometimes, you know, you know when ID like substitute things automatically for you, sometimes it picks the wrong one. So this, this makes this, that, 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 uh, that has this fringe benefit of the ID picking the correct one for you. So you should, you should know that there's no support for the default, default statement. This is something that also uh, tripped me. Um, uh, but um, I think these guys are working on to put that uh, in Beryllium because a lot of times, I mean, the, the, what really, what I really, tri what I really tripped on was not that there was no default value. It's because there is, if there is no value, the class is not really being created in the data store. You, 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 have, you have a null, right? You have to test for a null. So the, if the class exists, right? Because the class is not even created. It's not like the class is created and you get a value of zero or a value of null. The class is not even created. <laughs> Uh, last but not least, this is also like the, probably makes the top three. It's not s totally related to Yang, but it's related to Yang and RASConf, right? And one of the things that you see on the list over and over again is the fact that when you do a RASConf operation in open daylight, if you're adding, deleting, or updating something, there's no validation on that whatsoever. Right? Meaning, meaning, what do I mean by that? It means the operation goes directly to the data store and is acted upon, and then your application is notified. Right? So by the time you can do something, the operation has already been, been done. Everything is done on the data store. I mean, what, what, do we, what we do in the service function chaining uh, project is to sometimes re-roll. Re right? we, we go, we say, oh, the user should not, have, should not have done that, so we go and delete it, right? So one of the things that um, I'm, I'm big upon and, and ask the, uh, working with some of the young tools guys that are all, all on the back, is to have, say, um, what they call a commit cohort, right? In other words, when you do a REST conf operation, you get a notification in your application before the operation is done on the data store. This is a REST conf, right? So you can do, apply business logic. This is not like, is the guy using an integer, and is, if it's within the range? This is much more than that, right? It's applying business logic on your application, right? 
is the user allowed, is part of this group, is, is the, the, has he paid his bill? All this is business logic, right? And you need to do that validation before an operation is done. There are many other caveats and recommendations, but why, right? Why, why, right? And you, you have all of these little tricks and recommendations because the crux of the, the problem is, or the feature, I guess, is in Yang there are many different ways to accomplish the same design. You give two people and say, represent a toaster. The toaster is like the canonical thing when you're learning Yang, right? You look at the toaster model, right? If you ask two people to represent the toaster model, they both probably represent it correctly, but they used completely different things to represent it, right? Because there are choices and groups and groups within groups and lists and lift lists and things like that, right? So, so when, you, when, when you're designing a, a, a very rich model in the service function chain, you have this kind of rich, very rich models, right? You might stumble upon an issue or, or something that needs to be fixed. But, you know, this is a self-correcting issue, right? I mean, today, I mean, in the, in the beginning, at least, I don't know, maybe two years ago or so, I would stumble on many more of these uh, caveats and, and little things that I need to make a note here on the left. But today is, is, is very good, right? Uh, today, I do all these kind of rich models, and most of them are compiled correctly. I can write, I can read them, and everything else. But I consider that a, a self-correcting issue, right? You create some very sophisticated Yang model, maybe you stumble on an issue, it will get fixed. Right? That's the nature of it, right? Having said that, in open daylight, you could probably benefit from kind of uh, design patterns, like recommended design patterns. So, oh, I want to create a list within a list, and I want to be able to, you know, add, remove things, and et cetera. So, t tell me exactly if somebody, if you have a design pattern, a Yang design pattern for that, right? So I can just, you know, change the names or something, right? And just reuse it, right? <laughs> So and this is not to avoid discovering bugs. This is to, just so that you know, people use the same you know, tried and true design, right? Well, I think this is it um, from me. Anybody has any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No, you can do, if you use RPCs, you know, HTTP RPCs RESTConf, it can be, it can be intercepted by your application, right? But if you're using reg, regular RESTConf, for the lack of a better word, you know, HTTP put, you know, get, uh, delete, there's no, you cannot in intercept that. By the time your application get a notification, it's too late. So in SFC, we have this, we have this entire logic to prevent the user from, you know, doing bad stuff. I mean, huh? Only on yeah, exactly. After change. Ex after change, right? So, so there, there are a lot of, if you look at the SFC project, there are a lot of this code that says, hey, you cannot really delete a path or delete a device from a path. Hey, this device is being used. You should not do that. So we go and kind of correct all that after, after the fact. But what would be good is to have this kind of path integrity that I talked about, say, if a path if, 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 if the packet is going through this path and this path has this router, you cannot remove the router from it, right? I mean, it, it, you, maybe the guy would, would like to allow that, but normally you get an error saying, no, you, ca you, ca cannot, you cannot do that, right? <laughs> Go ahead. So when you regenerate, when you change the Yang model, regenerate everything is generated again. Everything is 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 everything is generated again. So the augmented code is also generated, right? If you get a Yang model and and and, and create an augmentation, right? Like you have another Yang model, and that Yang model is an augment. Okay, module A and module B is augmentation of module A. When you compile everything, module B, you will also be uh, generate into code. Java code will also be generated for the augmentation. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. Are you familiar with the extensible object patterns? Uh, I guess. Augmentations are extensible object patterns. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and how does that relate to the
Okay, any? Could you summarize that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> so Tony was explaining that um, that um, that um, uh, augmentations are uh, a pattern, object extens extensible patterns. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So based on the question of the gentleman there, what what happens when if you change your augmentation, right? So the augmentation is generated again. Um, so I th I hope I conveyed the. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to convey how Yang is powerful in, in general, and more specifically in open daylight, why you should use it, right? And if you use it with just a, a few things in mind, it will make your life in open daylight extremely easier, right? It generates Java code, not just stubs, right? Generate real Java code that you can use to integrate, to, to operate within the data store, or get persistence in cluster, clustering. That's the, the goal here, the takeaway. Go ahead. Yeah, this is a, this, you're not the first to ask for that, annotations in Yang, right? This is a big discussion, even the ITF in Tom's uh, working group, right? Today you cannot, there are tricks you can do, but th the answer is no, you cannot annotate Yang models, right? That's in a nutshell the answer, right? There's a lot of people that would like to do that. I'm, the, I'm one of them, that when generating between, you know, Yang and some other things, the annotation will create a few things for me, right? So special things depending on the language or, or, or the data structure that I, the data representation that I'm looking I'm looking at. All right, so yes? There is an ITF draft about annotations in Yang. I don't know if it's actually expired or not, but you can take a, take, a, take a look at that. It goes into the what you can use for annotations, because cert certain things you might think it's safe, Yang, to use for annotations. It's really not, um, for one reason or another, in the terms of the grammar. So you, you should. I, I don't have the reference in my head, but there is a Yang annotations uh, draft. Yeah, I and think that's covered in the, there's a, it's, it's called uh, recommendations for, uh, authors that are building models or something. I forget the title. I could show you where to look it up after. Any other questions? All right. All right, thanks. <laughs>